Hey, everybody. Is the mic on? You can hear me? Okay, cool. So uh, I'm a platform architect at BetterCloud. Um, unfortunately, what that means is uh, I sit in meetings all day and argue with people about what things should be named. Um, but I used to be a full stack developer. Um, but no, I, I actually do get to work with a lot of teams across Better Cloud, so the, the DevOps team, uh, the engineering teams, the QA teams, and sometimes sales and marketing. So I get a, a, a broad perspective of um, how, how our product infiltrates the market and how, um, uh, how the, the different systems, uh, different teams work together to be able to deliver that. So here we're going to talk about um, how, how we think about and design APIs uh, so that we can deliver successful ones. So, uh, let's see. So, um, yeah, throughout my career, I also worked at a couple companies that exposed pu uh, public APIs um, or internal APIs between teams. Um, so, uh, I've been a long time fanboy of Postman, actually forked the original uh, Chrome extension in 2012 when it was still an open source project, um, and quickly realized that I don't know how to use Angular and didn't like Angular, so I'm really glad Facebook released React. Uh, Better Cloud is uh, a tool suite for IT admins and security teams. So if you're technical, we implement the decorator pattern for admin APIs. If you're not technical, that means that uh, we, um, or sorry, if you think about G Suite or you think about Slack or Zendesk, they, they invest a lot of their engineering resources in the end users. So they make you more efficient uh, communicators across your team, so they make online document collaboration and sharing uh, better for you. They invest a lot of dollars to make your lives better. A nice way to put it is they invest less dollars in IT administration uh, tools and processes. So if you think about Slack, with Slack for a company with 5,000 employees, there may only be a two or three person IT team that has to manage that entire Slack instance. So two or three people managing 5,000 people, uh, and if you think about maybe five to 10% churn, you're onboarding and offboarding about 500 people per, uh, per year. It's, uh, that's a lot of time spent doing very manual tasks. And you heard from other talks that uh, when people have to get involved and do repetitive, boring things, that's, that's, uh, that's pr a prime candidate for, optim uh, for automation and optimization. So um, on top of uh, these admin APIs, we deliver um, advanced search functionality, we deliver reporting, uh, we deliver real-time streams so you can automate policy enforcement and remediation. So what's that actually look like in real life? Um, and, and here's just to give you a little perspective that for Postman to be useful for, to you, uh, whether it's a collaboration tool or an automated testing tool, you don't have to be an IBM. You don't have to work at a company that's an Atlassian. Uh, you also don't have to work at a company that has an engineering department of 100. Uh, a team of five could benefit from, um, from these types of tools and processes. Uh, but the big number that I want to call out here is uh, we make about one to five billion REST API calls per day. If you're good at math, you'll know that in one day, there's about 86,400 seconds. So if you do more math, uh, you'll throw about 1 billion REST API calls per day is about 12,500 per second. So at Better Cloud, we do somewhere between 10 and 50 REST API calls per millisecond. Um, and we do this across 12, we have 12 full integrations and probably about 20 other uh, light or partial integrations. Um, and integrations here, uh, Google is one of them, but uh, uh, if you think about Google, if you've ever integrated with their APIs, you know that there's a directory admin API, there's a Gmail API, there's a groups API, there's a reporting API, there's a uh, drive API. We, we actually integrate with six different APIs, sorry, seven if you include identity, seven APIs at Google just for one of those 12, uh, that the 12 metric there. So um, even within a single organization, um, uh, Lisa, the CTO of, uh, I forget the company, uh, but in a previous talk, she talked about uh, everybody does everything different. Even in Slack, there's five different ways to paginate. So even at Google, there's, uh, there's probably about 100 different APIs to integrate with. So our use cases at Better Cloud, 
Um, how we use APIs, we're mainly a streaming platform processing um, about a billion events uh, or just short of that per day and making all these enrichment uh, API calls um, and system level API calls. So if you look at the top, uh, SaaS providers, we integrate with, um, with uh, APIs like Google or Slack to pull down information, pull down events. Um, on the left, you see our platform API. Uh, this is us being a API provider. Um, uh, exposing some of our functionality to customers and partners. Uh, in the center, um, microservice to microservice. We have lots of internal APIs, um, and I'll differentiate between the, the three types of internal APIs. We have uh, uh, externally facing, so these are JOT protected for authentication internally. We use HMAC, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, and then the third type uh, is um, actually API ops tooling or backend functionality. So an API ops is a, a growing trend within the industry. You'll see GCP, you'll see API, uh, AWS, you'll see Elasticsearch. They're all exposing uh, endpoints so that you can start managing things programmatically through this common, uh, common technique or strategy of REST APIs. Um, and Postman is a great uh, ad hoc front end tool for doing that if they don't provide the admin interface. So the way that Better Cloud thinks about APIs uh, when we're integrating with them with external APIs or when we're designing and delivering internal APIs uh, is we think about performance and correctness. Arguably, you can split this into a million, you, you can slice and dice however you want, um, but, but we think of, we think of these, these two uh, major points. And then for each of them, we actually split it into, from our perspective as the provider, how do we think about it? And then also from the customer, the user's perspective, how do they think about it? So from my perspective, as an architect, how does the system perform under load? Resilience is really important um, when, I'm, when I'm measuring an API or designing it, how, how long will this API last? If I need to make uh, 100,000 calls per hour, is it gonna stand up to that load? If I need to make one call per day, I don't really care in actually measuring that. Um, but resilience testing, pro tip, uh, um, bursts of traffic is not actually resilience testing. 30 seconds of heavy load is nothing. Do push heavy load for hours. If not, if you can push for uh, up to 24 hours or 36 or 48 hours, do that because you'll discover a lot of things with memory pressure, data leaks, thread locking, edge cases. Um, uh, pro tip, please uh, invest in resilience testing if you expect load and do it for long periods of time, not bursts. Uh, sampling um, is from the client's perspective. Uh, when we release an API, what can they expect uh, in, in regards to performance? So is it certain latency metrics, uh, or is it maybe even just, we guarantee that the payload size is not gonna be bigger than X megabytes, or that we're never gonna send you a header with an entire stack trace in it that's you know, 64 kilobytes. Not that I would know anything about that. Uh, correctness, we think about, again, from uh, internal, internal perspective about what we release and from an external perspective. Uh, from internal, as an architect, I wanna know that, yes, we do have, in the metric on the previous slide, as you saw, we have 700 internal APIs. I wanna know that across all 700 APIs, I have a cohesive experience. If somebody knows how to use API 1, they know how to use API 699. Uh, so this is really important for query parameter naming schemes or capitaliz capitalization schemes. Uh, if, you, if you like underscore separated, you're wrong, I'm sorry, but it should be camel case. Uh, header naming schemes. If, if you've ever integrated with an API and for 500 of the calls, it was supposed to be authorization header, but on the 501st call, it was API token, uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and then feature testing is the one that um, everybody thinks of when they think of um, th uh, like the Postman testing scripts is does the call do what it's supposed to do? When I request a user, do I get a user payload back? Um, uh, or when I make a call to suspend a user or run a report, do I get the expected results back? So um, when when I think of uh, Postman, in all four of these are important. We have testing strategies for each of them. Um, but when I think of Postman and load testing, uh, if you know a way of hacking it to work, uh, I'd love to hear it. Um, but 
I, I don't know how to do that. So uh, we, we leverage Postman for uh, sampling, uh, sampling, smoke testing, and feature testing. And I'll talk about, based on our use cases, how do we do that. So of all the use cases I talked about so far, integrating with external APIs, uh, you know, making 30 calls per millisecond to external APIs, uh, we probably don't need any additional testing to let us know when that thing breaks or when latency get, you know, grows or shrinks. Um, we sort of got that under cover just by instrumenting our application. So we, we don't apply testing there. Um, and then API ops as well. Uh, we have a great uh, DevOps team that um, has, you know, there's industry tools, have it all put, hooked up to PagerDuty and through GCP and um, uh, Stackdriver and everything there. So uh, could Postman solve those use cases? Yes, absolutely. Do they solve them for us? Uh, no, we already had a solution in place. But I'll talk about the other two. So as an API provider, uh, this is what you think of uh, from a well-designed, well-thought-out API. We have tenant, or actually user-specific credentials. So given an API key, uh, we can tie that activity directly to a user. We can apply access controls on top of it. We can scope customer data such that they're only able to see what they can see. Uh, so we can, t we can go through all three of these tests. Sampling, we ensure that it's 500 milliseconds of latency or less. Depends on the endpoint you're hitting. Uh, smoke tests, we actually ensure that headers are there. So for example, cores. Um, this is something that we expose uh, so that um, our partners can embed it in, uh, in UIs. So uh, headers, we ensure that the cores headers are there and then feature testing. Um, we just make sure that if you make a request to our GraphQL to run a report or through our uh, action engine or automation uh, functionality, uh, all that actually works as expected. So happy path. Cool, we can use Postman Monitor to do what Postman Monitor said it can do. Sad path. Our internal APIs are better cloud. Um, we, so for internal APIs, uh, we use HMAC authentication, which uh, if you're technical, it's a uh, symmetric signing algorithm, meaning that the client and the server both have a, a key or a password. Um, the client will generate the request It'll put it through some hashing algorithm and generate a, a signature or a key. When that request gets sent up with that key, the server with the same password uh, does the same uh, hashing algorithm and makes sure that those two things match. Uh, when they do match, we assume that it's a trusted requester and we actually fulfill the request. So th this was very important uh, as a stream processing automation system, really important for us to do system level requests. Uh, but it was never really meant to, uh, for external systems to be able to do that. So when we hand off, we don't really want to hand off that private key to someone else, uh, a third party. And actually, I'm pretty sure we're legally obligated not to because of some compliance and uh, customer requirements. So we can't give that to Postman. Postman can't hit our internal APIs and get re successful requests. But the, the first point in college when my mind was blown by uh, computer science was uh, as an intro to Java class, maybe a month in or so. And uh, on the test, I had to write a, a, a unit test to ensure that a call successfully failed to one of my methods. So when I give bad input, it throws an exception, and the tests only pass when the code fails. So uh, being a little creative, we can't actually do feature testing here because, no offense, Postman, but we're not going to give you our passwords. Uh, keep your privates to yourself. Um, sampling, but sampling latencies, you can, we can make those calls unauthenticated, either completely omitting, uh, omitting the uh, authorization header or giving a bad value, uh, a bad signature there. And we can see that, you know, we get the, uh, we get, sufficient performance coming back. It's going through the system correctly, um, but also checking headers. So we know if it's, um, uh, we know if it's the correct errors coming back, if they're using the correct HTTP uh, response codes. Um, and these actually help a lot because when latency grows beyond that or headers are not present, that actually usually tells us that for better or worse, the way that we implemented our networking architecture, uh, that there may be a problem somewhere in the two hops through Nginx or the two hops through HA proxy or the internal console DNS before it ever reaches our microservice. So this is actually, these sort of tests, even though 
we are successfully failing. Uh, it gives us a lot of information about where to look, um, and we can start binary searching um, to ensure that one, the system's working as expected, we actually are enforcing authentication, but two, um, lets us know when there's problems in infrastructure as well. So uh, a, a common industry trend that I've seen is, if you think about cloud computing, uh, cloud computing is dirt cheap. Uh, if you don't believe me, sign up, get, go to DigitalOcean and get a server, a single CPU server for th it, $3 a month, $5 a month, whatever it is, and you can run your own uh, Docker images on there and have pr pretty much a, a side project running for $3 a month. So uh, then when you think about, for example, better cloud and think about scaling to 100 engineers, you can actually run a lot of single CPU instances or a lot of uh, cloud infrastructure for the price of a single developer or single engineer. So a, a realization as a platform architect, I think about how do we optimize applications, how do we optimize processes, how do we optimize engineers? I started realizing that, realizing that most of our cost was between the keyboard and the chair. It wasn't in the cloud. So some of the things that we really love about Postman is uh, collaboration pieces, but also um, Postman monitor tooling in, with rich functionality out of the box. So developer productivity. We are using Postman already for local testing, and they are writing post, uh, the um, uh, test scripts to run after each request. So we're already doing that. We might as well schedule it and have it run against our deployed environments where appropriate. Uh, they give historical trends. It's one thing to just see that, oh, my latency is under 500 milliseconds. Cool, don't care. But if you see that thing steadily creeping up, creeping up, uh, you at least, you can project when it's gonna be a problem, or you know that, oh, crap, that last release kind of doubled what we had been seeing in the past. We should probably look at that. Um, and then out of the box integrations, yes, it's easy to write Slack bots. Yes, it's easy to glue code together, but if you can take a developer and instead of them spending a single day or a single week building this integration, gluing things together, uh, if, if, that, if you just get that for free, you should get it for free. So, um, so these are some of, the, some of the reasons why we started migrating automated tests over to Postman monitors because uh, it, it's set up out of the box for you. If you've never used Postman monitor, I challenge you, Spend two minutes reading the documentation. Spend 45 seconds making a request. Click the drop-down button, click monitor, and then watch it be deployed and run live in the cloud in another 60 seconds. In under five minutes, honestly, in five minutes, you can follow a tutorial to have something running in the cloud in five minutes. Oh crap, I messed it up. Go back, fix the thing, hit save. Go back to the, to the browser and hit run again, it, it's immediately live, it syncs. All the glue code's built up for you, all the scaling, everything's set up so that when you talk about developer productivity, it's there. Um, the other thing is I've seen lots of side projects and GCP actually released, Google Cloud Scheduler, uh, schedules as a web, or uh, sorry, webhooks as a service. There's other ways that you can creatively use it. I'm not saying abuse it, but uh, within a uh, Postman collection, you can put as many requests as you want. GCP limits you to one request per trigger. Uh, and you can, we're not exactly sure how we're gonna use this uh, internally, but we're looking at ways to do automated operations. So look at non-critical alerts or running database remediation, uh, database corruption type things, as well as business insights, running reports. Uh, so what's next? Um, I mentioned because of our auth strategy, we can't give Postman our secrets. Uh, so we're looking at using Newman, uh, hooking that into our CI CD pipeline. Um, but again, developer productivity, all the glue code's not there, the schedules aren't hooked up, the outputs aren't hooked up. You sort of have to do that yourself. So uh, this room in this conference, you are API consumers, you are API providers, um, you are the thought leaders in the API community. So let's collaboratively work together to make a better cloud. That's my only dad joke.